welcome to Our Africa, the show that aims to unite all Africans on the continent. And I'm your host, Audrey Chimwanda. Today we meet foreign nationals who've been contributing to job creation, they've been contributing to the country's economy. We'll also discuss how we can break colonial borders on the African continent. For the longest time, South Africa has been viewed as the hope for Africa. With the infrastructure, the economic opportunities in the country, there are foreign nationals who love what we're about and end up moving here and settling down. My name is Didier Bayeye. I'm born Congolese, living, living in South Africa for more than 20 years now and basically living my whole life in South Africa. I am Adetunji Omotola. I'm the founder of the Guild of Nigerian Professionals South Africa. I am also the founder of Nigeria Diaspora Television. I am also the founder of African Wine Circle. Didier didn't have much of a choice on living in Muzansi. The decision was made for him by his father who moved here while he was still young. As for Aditunje, it was his father's influence and some extensive research that he did while living in England that convinced him that this was the place to be. Um, coming to South Africa was not my choice actually. And as I was growing up as a child, I never had a dream or thinking of coming to South Africa, but it was basically my parents. I grew up with a dream, if there's a country that I wanted to go to was Canada and I have no idea why for some reason I just uh, f that country was so much in my in my mind um, to a certain point that um, due to work reasons uh, my father had to relocate come to South Africa in fact the whole family so this is how we moved to South Africa and uh, as a young man it was actually not my choice and I had to attend school here and then grow up here and well it became a home for me. When I was in England I've always wanted to come to South Africa because I felt that South Africa had a lot of push and pull in terms of advancement, the history, all of that. But I moved back to Nigeria from England in 1999. When I got to Nigeria two years after I ran into a lady at a hotel in Lagos called the Eco Hotel. And of course, as they say, the rest is history. I found myself coming to South Africa for the first time, August 2001, and by February 2002, I had paid Lobola. Didier has since established himself in the tourism industry, a job that he has a passion for and that allows him to travel and interact with other Africans on the continent. I work in travel industry, in tourism industry, um, where I've been for the past 17 years. This is the only industry I have worked for. Um, I got my become degree in international relations. That was my first degree before many others that, are, that I have. I also related to tourism industry, which I um, achieved well already working into the industry. Yeah. So when I finish my studies, I will just have to open a small bracket here, which is uh, part of my good story to tell, is that though I went to school and uh, qualified, but the job that I wanted to didn't just come easily. For Aditunje, it was more of a journey of discovery that also led him to finding love on our shores. Look, when I came here, first of all, it was different. It wasn't like the UK, it wasn't like the US. I mean, I, I came across things like foot suits. Um, you know, a lot of things were different. You queued to get into a restaurant. But I saw that the infrastructure was very solid. In fact, my late father, who was then at VITS, as a senior research fellow, said to me, this is the biggest inheritance project ever, because he's a property lawyer. And so when I went back to Nigeria, I used to stay in Abuja. I'd do a comparison. I'd look at Abuja. Yes, it's great, but the restaurants were not really there. And being somebody who was into lifestyle, 
I felt that every time I came here, we'll have wine, you know, enjoy the food, go to Soweto. There was so much to discover, Cape Town. So I started to lean in, and because there was a lot of interest, I made a decision very quickly. And uh, yeah, I decided to settle down. But it was very difficult to get a job because I had too many qualifications. And at the time in South Africa, there was an emphasis on BEE. So it was quite tough, but I finally broke through, uh, got a job with Old Mutual, private wealth management. I think I was helped by the fact that I had done stockbroking in England. So when I found it difficult to get into the legal profession because of all the hurdles, I, I brought out my second hat, which was my financial qualifications, and I was able to get a job. In, that was in 2006 that I was able to get in there. Well, getting a job in our country is not as easy as you may think. In fact, it is much harder for African brothers and sisters. Some people in South Africa have the perception that our African brothers and sisters come here to take their jobs. But it's not easy for foreign nationals to get hired. Most of them have small beginnings that lead to more doors of opportunity. It is actually similar for South Africans who move to the United Kingdom, to the United States and even Asia for greener pastures. Something that is a worldwide phenomenon. In fact, about 240 million people in the world do not live in their own countries of birth, but end up becoming naturalized citizens as time goes by. Somebody came and told me that there was a white guy who was looking for a gardener. Um, I didn't want to go, but this uh, man encouraged me and say, look, you just have to start somewhere to a point that I had to put up my mind and said, but it's not about being or working as a gardener, but I don't even know what to do as a gardener. If I knew, known or I had an idea uh, as a gardener, this is what you do, I would have done it, but where do I start now? Um, the guy was so persistent and said to me, you go, that man will show you what to do. So I had to basically leave, put aside my qualifications and all my knowledge and go and work as a gardener. Even with a qualification, most African nationals find it difficult, but their willingness to start small and try new things gives them a bit of an edge. This guy could actually notice that I didn't know what to do, but I just wanted something to do. So every morning he will call me, did you come and show me this is the sprinkle, this is how you connect it. You put it like this and you switch on there, it will sprinkle here. You give it 30 minutes, then you move it to the next place. And then um, you check if you see the yellow leaves of the flowers, just you remove them and you know, this plastic, you put them, put them there. Or if it's got something particular you would like me to do, you will tell me what to do. Getting a job, look, I say looking for a job is a job in itself. You have to have skills, you have to know how to deploy your profile. You have to have networks. You have to understand the culture and also understand where the gaps are. You have to study the sectors of the economy that are doing well. You have to read a lot to be able to get a proper job. Now, also, it doesn't help when your name, they can't even pronounce your name. You know, your name is Aditranji and they say, oh, your name is difficult. And also what I felt in the early stages was that because of where South Africa was at the time, you had, there was a need to fill in uh, jobs for locals first. And that's where you'd have things like you're not prejudicing a South African. You know, the labor laws are quite clear. When you want to bring a foreigner in, you mustn't prejudice a South African. And of course, you have to have what they call exceptional skills or what they now call critical skills. And for me, the skills that I have are not critical. I'm not a neurologist or a pilot and my skills are not exceptional. Even though they're advanced, I've got advanced knowledge in social sciences and law, 
but for South Africa, when I got here, those skills were not so um, rare. So, I thought, you know, but naturally, you also have to pay your dues. So if you get into a country, you got to pay your dues. You start from somewhere, and that was what I had to do. I had to work for smaller companies and run around in the township and sell products in Sebokeng and uh, places like Lenasia and go to taxi ranks and, you know, all the small uh, shops there and, and, you know, support them with products, hair products. And I was quite good at it. But the old mutual job came along and I dumped the other one. Starting over is always an opportunity to rebuild what you truly want. While I was there, within two months, I saw another white lady coming and saying, are you Didier? I said, yes. He said, I spoke to your boss and he told me that you speak French. I said, yes. And she said, my two kids would like to join their father in Lebanon and um, their father speaks French. So I've been looking for somebody who will be teaching them French. <laughs> so um, we made an agreement. So I started, of course, it was my boss who referred me. So it became kind of uh, my extra job that I was doing on the side. Um, after work, after four, I will go there only twice a week to teach these kids, it was a girl and a boy, try and teach them French. But in the process, what this lady was paying me is basically the same as this couple I was staying with were paying me for the whole month. With the unemployment rate in our country sitting at the highest it's ever been, there is also this false perception that jobs are readily available. This is um, quite interesting and I believe that this is the part most people don't know or don't understand or they just don't get this information. When it comes to, as a foreign national, getting a job, it's not easy. First of all, I would have to say that if you don't have South African ID, <laughs> you are already standing at 98% chance of not being employed. And here we're talking of uh, corporate industry, um, your kind of uh, stable uh, permanent job. Uh, we're not talking of, uh, for example, just being a casual at a restaurant or doing dishes or car guard. Um, we not really, I'm not really counting that level of, 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 of job. Um, any other formal industry, it's quite difficult. Well, look, I think South Africans think that jobs are available or that they can always get a job because they're South African. And once they've got a degree, they can get a job. I think that's a misconception anywhere. I mean, there's no job opportunities like in the 60s or 70s where there were fewer doctors, fewer lawyers, and so there's too much competition. Even if you have a degree, you've got to have a, an extra degree. Even if you have an extra degree, you've got to have an extra, maybe a language proficiency or computer literacy, Excel, Word, and so on. You've got to be able to do public speaking because if you're going to stand in front of clients, you've got to have a lot of things, your manners, your all those things will come into being. So people think, oh, once I get a degree, I go to VETS, I go to UCT, I will get a job. There's no such thing. It's highly competitive, maybe 10,000 people chasing two or three jobs. And you get a sense of that quickly when you're in Europe, advanced economies where you apply for jobs all the time and you get letters of rejection all the time. And if you finally get one job, you hang on to it for dear life. So I think South Africans must be aware of that. But also I think that in uh, South Africa, a lot of people do not use their hands, unlike the rest of the continent, particularly in West Africa. So people need to learn how to use their hands. They are those African nationals who come here and plow back into the country's economy by establishing organizations that end up hiring the locals. There's an existing project now, which is declared by a heritage site by the city of Johannesburg, which I ran from scratch up until uh, the project was completed. And as we speak, it went from 2010 up until uh, uh, end of 2009, up until uh, June 2011. Then we were ready to go and operate as a uh, museum and a hotel. And I was uh, 
entirely in charge. This is a private project, not even the government project. Private funded project. Now, I had employed 11 South Africans. Now, these 11 South Africans permanently employed, um, made their medical aid are paid. The challenge we have as Africans is that we've looked at our borders as a way of outlining the differences, while in fact, we have a lot of similarities that go beyond our hair texture and our skin color. Well, it's time to take a break. When we come back, we take a look at an initiative that looks to unite Africa. Stay with us. <laughs> 